Mr. Dale, you've told us about the schools and uh, that you attended and your long affiliation with Campbell AME Church. Uh, we know that Almore must have inherited from you his civic mindedness. What are some of the organizations and associations that you've been affiliated with over the years? Well, I was associated with uh, the Hillsdale Civic Association. I was president in several times down through the years. And uh, I worked in, in late years, a number of the uh, organizations such as the uh, you got now what you call this United Gilbert's Forum. Way back there, what did the they call it? Community Chess. I was one of the first ones in that community chess. And then it was segregated. We had a white and a black set up in the community chess. And uh, as I say, I was in the Hillsdale Civic Association, president several times, secretary several times. Who was the president when you were the secretary? Uh, Alan Jackson at one time. Alan F. Jackson. And then? Parker. No, Mr. no, Parker was ahead of my time. Mm -hmm. I wasn't old enough to be associated with those men. Those but Mr. Charles Howard. Charles Howard. Was I was the president. He was president at one time, and I was his secretary. First time I was seeing John, what was his name, John? That's Gold the only piece of paper I got with his name on it. All right. All right. So now, do you want to tell us about buying the, the buying of the house from John Bruce? Well, as... Well, I'm sorry. First, why don't you go back and get married? Uh-oh. 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 We just, just had the marriage license at Brought out, and it's in that little room, baby. Mm. They'll take your word for it, honey. All right. Yes. <laughs> uh, well, let's go back. Let's go back to the marriage. Right. Mm -hmm. Her mother and father died within a year of each other, and she became then, of course, uh, an orphan. Is that what you'd call it? Uh -huh. Our parents. Right. See, our parents. and. They died so close together and quickly that a guardian was never appointed or administrator or anything, anybody. So the immediate neighbors took over these six children and they started living with this one, the other one, this one, the other one, and finally, uh, while, as I said, I, I, I think I finished two years in, Nom, in uh, M Street. And finally, got to the place where she'd gone around in a circle almost. And so we decided, I said to her, we'll get married. I said, I, I don't have anything, but I think I can find a place for you to sleep. And I came home from, at that time, she was living up there on College Street, Howard University. I told my father, mother about it, and he said, all right, son, as long as I got a piece of bread, you got a piece of bread. Of course, he was working, as I said, in the pension office. And that was on Friday night. And I can't tell you now to save my life how I ever got from Hillsdale or Anacostia, way up at Howard University in those days, uh, 65 years ago, to go see her. I, I don't know how I got there. <laughs> that wasn't 65 uh, years, John. Huh? 67. It's been long than that. 67. You want to make it worse than what this one? What's the matter with you? I just want to tell the truth. All right. Well, anyway, I'm not uh, the next morning, the next morning, my father and a cousin of hers, where she was staying, 
went to the district building to get a license to marry. And when we got there and applied for the license, the man said to us, or said to her, looked at her, and he says, uh, uh, yeah, you can get a license, <laughs> but he can't. But well, he said, if you go to Rockville, you all can get a license. And in those days, you went from Georgetown over there to Rockville by trolley car. We left and went by trolley car to Rockville. You were how old? I was 19. She was 17. And when we got to Rockville, the clerk in the office asked, said to her, you can get a license. And he turned to me and said, you can't get a license unless your mother gives her written consent. You'll have to have her written consent. You're only 19 years old. My father came all the way back on that trolley car, San Casio or Bay Farms, and came back and brought mother's, my mother's written consent that I could get married at 19. She was 17. I thought you were 18. You were, I no. Was say, you weren't but 18. My father's birthday is in July. Mother's is in October, so oh. he would be 19. Oh. Be 19, that's right. That's right. Mm -hmm. Well, I, I skipped them a couple of months, and I, I took on <laughs> and, and called myself 19. And uh, <laughs> we found that it was a terrible day. It started to rain late in the evening, and brother it rained pitchforks during the night until my father got back there. We came home, and the car stood there on Nickel Avenue. Got up next morning, we went to Sunday school, went to church, came home, had dinner, and it was about through dinner, my mother beckoned for me to come out of the dining room or the kitchen, I believe it was, where we were eating, and she said to me, Henry, I'll go with you tomorrow morning, you and Lucille, to Peter Grogan, that was the big furniture store in Washington, in which my father had an account. And I'll stand for a bedroom suit. <laughs> you find somewhere to go, you can't stay here. <laughs> <laughs> and, and our bedroom suit cost $46. <laughs> yes, sir. And we moved from there. I had a sister who had married a few couple of years, two or three years ahead of me. And she was renting a house up on Douglas Road, across the street from where the junior high school is now. Who was that? Uh, Mary. Mary. My sister Mary. Mary Hill she is now. Her husband died, and she's still living. And, Excuse me, uh, and the whole house rented for $6,000. <laughs> <laughs> and, and yeah, it was. We paid half the rent. And she paid four <laughs> rooms. That's right, two up and two down. And she was paying six dollars a month, and we took the back room. She had the front room, and we paid the three dollars. And soon after that, three dollars a month. A few years after that, uh, she moved out. Then we had a whole the house. house. <laughs> And, that's and the whole thing. Norman and Alma were born. Norman, Alma, and Alma were born there. Yes, sir. Three of the children. This yeah. girl's born on Sumner Road. Yeah. <laughs> Sumner Avenue. Sumner, Sumner Road. Road. Yeah. Sumner Road. Yeah. All right. So now, you went to work. Your first job after you got married was where? St. Elizabeth Saint Hospital. Hospital. Doing what and how much did you get? I was rated then as a kitchen helper. They put me in the kitchen. I had to wash the pots and pans and keep the kitchen floor clean, mopped up every day, and help the cooks in any way they 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 wanted me, such as helping to prepare to prepare the food, peeling potatoes. And I got eighteen dollars a month. And my laundry and my boy a room. But of course, I lived just a little below St. Elizabeth, and I stayed home. Didn't take advantage of that lodging. I did get my meals uh, at the hospital where I worked. 
Then you went from there where? Went from St. Elizabeth, <laughs> maybe a few years, no. Sure. Went to the Landsberg Furniture Company. Oh, that's right. In those days, they the sold, yeah, in those days, they sold goods by the yard, and women made their dresses and suits and mm-hmm. things. And all woolen goods had to, to be shrunk, or they ran them over a machine where steam came out as it went over, and that was supposed to keep them from shrinking any more after a person bought them. And uh, a little later on, maybe a year, I was told by, about a man at that, day, at that time, the big, big man in politics, as they called it, was Perry Carson in Washington, D.C. He had a man working under him by the name of Scott, a little hunk, humpback man. And somebody told me to see that man. I had taken an examination for skilled labor, but had never gotten an appointment. And when I did get to see him, I told him about it. And he says, give me $10 and I'll see about it. <laughs> oh, wait a minute, is that lit? <laughs> That's all right. That's fine. And shortly after that, I got an appointment at the government printing office where I stayed for about two years. And finally, I took the examination and went into the post office because they told me, listen, I was working under a young white fellow from Vienna, Virginia. There was only four or five of us in this particular section. And he was trying to get me, I was getting $2 a day. He was trying to get me a promotion. And he finally came back one morning and said, uh, Mr. Dale, I'm, I'm going to tell you just like it is, or tell just the truth about it. He says, I've, just, I've been going back and forth down to the ma- to the office, Mr. Lamb, asking him to give you a raise. You helped me wonderfully, broke me in this job and all of that. And uh, I just left there. And he told me this morning, it wasn't the policy, no need of my coming back, it wasn't the policy of the government printing office to pay a Negro more than $2 a day. I went home from work that day, and there was a letter there from the post office offering me a job as substitute letter carrier. And I got off the next day, went to printing office work, and got off and went down to post office to see about it. When I got back, he told me and Mr. Lamb said, going to give me a raise. Too late then, because I'd accepted the job at the post office. The post office that you refer to, that's the post office in Anacostia. No. Wasn't an Anacostia post office in those days. Everything was main office over there by uh, 12th and Pennsylvania Avenue. Then later on, they built the one over there at Union Station. But in those days, I, I was appointed from the 12th and Pennsylvania Avenue post office. Wasn't I, I have a little story. I, I don't know whether you want to take up the time to tell it or not, but anyway, uh, take too long, cut me off, but I like to tell it. <laughs> that was 1913. The Republicans were in power. And... Uh, Killer Rosa, right? No. Uh, All right, go ahead. Sorry. I can't, but I can tell you who the other man was. The man who beat out the Republicans and had a great upset out in uh, California. That was Wilson. Mm-hmm. That was when Wilson beat out the Republican who was in power, 1913. And this man was still the assistant postmaster under the Republicans. And when I went in his office and showed him the letter, he asked me what he could do, help me. Uh, and, and I showed him the letter. And he says, well, what do you want to do? I said, I don't know. 
I said, some of my friends tell me that substitute letter carrier in the post office is a starvation job. And I said, I got a wife and three children. I don't know what to do. He says, well, it's up to you to make the final decision. But if you take my advice, you'll take this job. So that's not until that stuff about starvation job. I said, you can make a living substituting. And I took it. And after the Republicans went out, and of course this man went out with them, his name was Robinson. I met that man on the streets in the early part of the Democratic administration in, a, in the winter time. And he was walking, you told me walking on the office. He was walking on his office. They'd thrown him out of a job. He couldn't find work. And I felt like I wanted to go and offer that man a dollar. I was just so affected by that. I'll never forget him. If he hadn't encouraged me to take it, I may not have still taken that post office job, and I wouldn't be here today. All right, so you, you took the substitute. Then what else? Well, strange to say, I got enough money. I had two friends who were in the post office. One of them was Wormley. And one was uh, Leon, Leon. Leon, and one was uh, who's the man down to friendship? Whiting. Uh, Whiting. 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 They were both in the post office, regular carriers, and those two men arranged with their friends, the other carriers, to take off two hours four hours or a day now and then to give me work. They both finally became preachers. They came in there one day at lunch. We were sitting down eating, and Leon said, well, says, I'm, I'm gonna, I feel the Lord's calling me to preach, and I'm going to switch from carrier to clerk so I can work at night and run my church in the day. Benny Whiting said, well, I've talked to you about it, and I feel the Lord called me to preach, but I'm not switching from anything. <laughs> he says, I'm quitting the post office. <laughs> and you see where he is today, that Friendship Baptist Church. That's Benny Whiting, that youngster who helped me. He's been there all these years. All right, so then you... Um... Then uh, in the post office, it turned out, New law was passed called the 8 and 10, I believe, which called for the appointment of more regular carriers and clerks. And after about a year and a half, not quite two years maybe, I came in under that law and was made a regular carrier. Uh, my starting salary was $800. Yeah, $800 a year. A year. Now, my brother ahead of me was a carrier, and when he came, came in, the regular salary was $600 a year. He got 600 But the good thing about the post office that, that drew me was, according to law, every year, if your rating warranted it, you had done your work and your record was good, you got a $100 promotion. Wasn't dependent on supervisor anybody. That's the thing I liked about it. And that's the reason, as I say, that was the thing that drew me into the post office. I was appointed a regular at $800 a year. And from that time on, things just picked up. I got, that was when I came to Ancosta, to the Ancosta station, or soon after that. And, uh, well, about this time, you also uh, moved from Elvin's Road down to Sumner Road, right? Oh, Lord, I've been no, from, no. We never did live on No. Oh, I'm I've sorry. been down on Sumner Road. I was, uh, oh, uh, Norman, they were all born up on Douglas Road. Yes, Douglas. we have that on. 
<laughs> and then we moved around from Douglas. There was a house standing right in a triangle there as you go up to Catholic Church. The fellow moved in there and he fixed it all up and made a beautiful place of it and suddenly he disappeared from me. White man. No. Well, the first man was a white man. Yeah. But a color fellow moved in there afterward and fixed that place all up and then he just disappeared. I, so, I don't can't remember what his name was. I anyway, last time I was up that way, that house was still there, but the weeds was eating it up. And we stayed there for maybe a year. And then we moved to Sumner, started buying this place on Sumner Road. Sumner From Ad John Bruce. C. Bruce. John What's that C stand? Conklin. Colburn. Colburn. Colburn Bruce. Roscoe yeah. right. So now what did Mr. Bruce do? Well, the, the details uh, haven't been and still are not too clear. But I know I contracted with him through somebody to buy that piece of property. And the, the buying price was $2,000. I can remember that much of it. But uh, now, Uncle, did Uncle Marcus Dale live around the corner then? Yeah, he lived at 2607 Martin Luther King Avenue. No, Nichols. Uh, Nichols. It was Nichols then, yeah. Now his property went all the way from Nichols to Wade Road, didn't it? No, no, no didn't go all the way. It it went to the back of, the of our place on Sumner. Our place ran into his place, mm -hmm. and the rest of that field, from there on out to Wade, and from his house on up to my father's house, was owned by, what's that woman's name? Hmm. Anyway, his property didn't run all the way through, neither did mine. Mm -hmm. That field back there where those apartments are now, and where Taylor had a house next to the Nichols Avenue house, see, that property was owned by Taylor's sister, and I can't think of her name right now. Mm -hmm. And uh, it was all cut up in those days. There were no surveyors, <laughs> even uh, uh, even back to, to, to my days, 50, 50 years ago. Uh, people just stepped off so many feet of ground and sold it to somebody else. And then years afterward, you come to find out one was overlapping the other. And when they did start some sort of system of surveying and sort of whatnot, you had to go to court and establish. And I just told you about my case there. A woman that owned a house on the corner of Nichols and some. Mrs. Wilkinson. She claimed that I was two feet over on her property. But before uh, she moved That's there. Garnet Wilkinson's sister-in-law. Her mm -hmm. husband, Richard Wilkinson, was also a letter carrier, yeah. mail carrier. Now, Uncle Marcus delivered mail in a, with a horse and wagon, yeah. right? Rural. And he also had a cow. Oh, yeah. Right. So that's how rural that whole area was yeah. at that uh, time. He had hogs. He had chickens. I, I have often said he killed himself working. Mm -hmm. Accumulating, mm -hmm. but anyway, yeah, that was working in the bureau. And she worked in the bureau, and, then he was and didn't have a one child. And he was in the he was in the mail. Uh, While we're talking about property, Mr. Dale, we've been curious as to how uh, the government acquired uh, Barry Farms for the development of a federal housing project. There, did they uh, use condemnation proceedings to get that land? Yeah, of course. That's that, that that's uh, that's that's modern. That that was during FDR's time. That first project in the city of Washington, I think, was built. Takes in down there on Sumner Road, Wade Road, uh, Stevens Road, and First Sterling. It wasn't called that then. Didn't have any name. It just bordered on the railroad track. And that was built just during FDR's time, and they just condemned. There wasn't, a, I would say, there wasn't a dozen houses in that whole track 
and it was owned by those people who lived there. This Reverend Parker, who was uh, president of the Civic Association at one time, lived there. A man by the name of Minor lived down there. And they administered to uh, some big, big Baptist church. Was that friendship? Or? Who's that? Uh, Reverend Parker. And no, then Parker there was also that in that whole development there was Eureka Park. Yeah. And uh, that is in here. That's the way we got to the, my folks got their outlet. They'd come over there, they were, there were two orchestras, they called them. Uh, I can't think of them now. That played, and they had these dances practically every night. And they'd they come from them. Southwest. Most people that were living in Washington in those days were in Southwest. That was the ghetto, as they call it now. And they came to these parks for amusement, paid so much to go in. The man who owned the park would pay the, pay the orchestra, and they'd dance and have a good time, as they called it, in Eureka and, and Greenwilla. And Greenwilla. Well, what was the old man's name? Tom somebody that owned Greenwilla. Yeah, well, uh, what's called him? Uh, Wes owned Eureka. Yeah, but the, this and was Tom Green. Yeah, that's right. Tom Green. owned all the property that took in this uh, park, together with some couple of small houses. Well, he owned all that side of some road, didn't he, up to Nichols Avenue? No, no, no. Tom no. Green. No, Tom didn't own all that. No. No. Uh, Butler was in there. Chorus. Father-in-law, mm -hmm. and then old man West lived on Sumner Road, mm -hmm. and he owned Eureka that faced on Nichols. Nichols see? And uh, oh, my yeah, there God. was quite a bit. He, old man Tom didn't own all, of it. but it 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 has been pitiful. It still is. How? The white man, flim flam, I guess that's a good word. My people. All that property over there, I'm telling you, that we've been talking about by farm area, it was said in the beginning that no white man was to own a foot of it. And he now owns most of the feet. <laughs> See? I was just reading in the paper yeah, this morning, I think it was, I partly read it, somebody right in Washington City, out southeast or northeast there, how they were flim-flammed and almost lost their home yesterday, had been put up for auction because of some mix-up and some way that they entered into an agreement with this monarch rebuilding or remodeling company is concerned. And you know, a lot of them uh, just lost their property just, just for a grocery bill or something like that. Yeah, paid a little money, borrowed a little yeah, money. Yeah, they borrowed money too. Twenty-five, fifty dollars Paid the grocery bill. And <laughs> well, do you know one thing? Uh, at one time in Washington, D.C., if you owned property, you had to go to the district building and call for your tax bill. Now, if you fail to go, I think it was after a year or maybe a year, two years, it was advertised in the paper, the daily paper. How many of my folks read the daily paper? After it was advertised a certain length of time, it was supposed to be sold so the district could pay the taxes, get the taxes that should have been paid. There were two or three men at that time who were in cahoot with the district building, and they were always informed whose taxes hadn't been paid. And they'd go to the district building and pay that tax without saying anything to the party, pay that tax, and after a couple of years, I think it was, they got what they call a tax deed. 
and in most instances the ads and all that just died off and nobody thought any more about it and that property became that white man's property. That's, and that's how one about, thing. Yeah. How about when this very boy here owned the gro had the grocery store next door to us and you were right in there. I, and uh, somebody came and Miss Dale, I know oh, you're a big grocery bill, but I can't pay you because I got to get, pay something on the car. Let's get, I just want to ask one question now that we are anxious to know about. To your knowledge, are any of the original buildings, uh, we know that the, that the original brick uh, structure built for the public school, Bernie Building, is still standing. Mm -hmm. But are there any other original structures, churches, large halls, anything like that still standing? Well, right next large hall. Right next door to us with the art hall. Yeah. That's still standing. It's been, been remodeled, oh, possibly 30 years ago. But that building is still there. It's 1265, 1265, some on the road, right next to our house. And next door on the other side is a family by the name of... Uh, that was Moses' house. And Gene, wasn't Gene Russell. Now those are that and the Burton School, the only two places that I can recall that are still there. I don't know what's house, 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 that stood for many years on Mount Zion Hill, now known as Douglas Road. And that is now where the Douglas Junior High is. Yes. So there's no building there for the Mount Zion Church. 